Life happens, and not always the way we expect it to. Every single day, we face change, stress, and uncertainty. What if you could learn to thrive no matter what life throws your way? Resilience expert Adam Markell and his inspiring guests explore breakthrough strategies to fully embrace change and build the resilience required to become change-proof. On today's Change Proof podcast, we have Nina Sossman Pogue, a speaker and author with a fascination for resilience and success after change. A former Emmy Award winning TV news anchor, tech exec, and member of the USA gymnastics team, she shares that failure went along with all of those wins as the backdrop for her speaking, her podcast, and her amazing book, This Is Not the End. Really wonderful book title. You're going to love this conversation today, so enjoy. All right, Nina, here's my first question to you. What's something, just one thing, actually, that's not a part of your standard bio that you would love for people to know about you? Mm. Uh, I actually recharge all alone. I am one of those people that gets a lot of energy from from people. I just did a huge event, like 3,500 people, and I loved it. I had so much energy, but it took me two days of kind of being on my own to... Mm. To be alone. That's where I do my best, my best recharging and my best thinking. I don't share that with many people because they expect me to be so out there. But um, I know, right? Know. I mean, there, there's, there's some, there is really a bit of a surprise. And you and I are simpatico right out of the gate um, because <laughs> I, I will often say that to or audiences when we talk about energy. And when I, I'm speaking mm-hmm. about that topic in relation to resilience, as an example, I will say to people, so how do you recharge? Because our our definition of resilience is not about endurance or grit or grind or any of that stuff, you know, that we know just at this point doesn't work. It doesn't work long term, um, but it's recovery and the rituals for our recovery that produce longer lasting resilience. Um, So I'll say to them, so how do you recover? Do you recover with other people or do you recover on your own? I say, so you might be surprised me standing on this stage or wherever I am at the moment, right? Talking to a whole bunch of people that my method is just as yours is, Nina, I have to be alone. It's a solitary experience. And I consider myself an introvert in that respect. I get energy back. I regain it through my own practice. That's more mm-hmm. internal and other people like my own, my own brother, my own, uh, you know, flesh and blood. He has to be, or wants to be in crowds of people, loud music, you know, all that energy, which I get, um, but that's how he actually recharges his battery. So it's so it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and and, and I, I like a big concert. Love to go in for a bit, but it sort of exhausts me. I need to be on my own. And I have been had such a public life and so many different aspects of my life, and been out in front performing. Even my young days as an athlete, performing out there, that people think I would just be all out there all the time, but. It's not the other thing I was going to, that came through my head when you asked me that I was going to say, well, I'm working on my handstand right now because uh, <laughs> I have, I have this thing where even if I turn a hundred, I still have to be able to stand on my hands. And oh so uh, I'm in a big, I'm in a crunch time between now and Christmas by the end of the year. Cause I've been slacking off a little bit. Good for you. I mean, yeah. I was a, so you I was a swimmer in college mm-hmm. aspiring to be a much better swimmer than I actually was. <laughs> I had a few moments, you know, I, I, I made my parents proud because it seemed like anytime people would show up to see me swim, I was just like, I was like shot out of a cannon, you know, when they weren't <laughs> there, not, not quite so much or whatever, right. and certainly not in practice, which is a whole other story, but, but it's funny because there's, um there's an element of, of, you know, like for me, I, I have to still be able to do a flip turn. I still have to be able to swim Mm -hmm. when I, when I'm in the pool with other swimmers, I'm going to go back and forth using flip turns. And that's, so you have to be able to do a a handstand. Yes. And you also were a gymnast in college, but not just an ordinary athlete. Like I would call myself in that arena, but you had some other kind of experience. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Nina? Yeah, well, I was on the U.S. team before college, so young in my career, in like 15, 16, I was on the U.S. team back in the day with uh, Mary Lou Retton and Bart Connor and that group. And so I went to Japan and Hungary and Germany and Australia, like all over the world. But then I didn't make the Olympic team. I call that one of my first big this is one of those moments where my whole life went in a new direction. But then I was a college athlete uh, and I blew out my knee. My fresh, I was top recruit, one of the top recruits in the nation. I went to LSU, big SEC fan. And um, 
it was a, a great gymnastics program and I blew out my knee my freshman year. And then I like to say, uh, I kind of went on to graduate in booze and beer, uh, b- boys and booze for a <laughs> while. But uh, yeah, I um, blew out my knee and really had a difficult time trying to figure out who I was without gymnastics because it had been my whole life. Sure. And, and and just like swimming and this, I think these two sports actually have this in common. They You get started, like if you're going to be super successful in that arena, more often than not, you're not a late bloomer. I got started in swimming when I was in like my sophomore year in high school. Right. But these kids that I was swimming against even then had been in AAU meets and been swimming since they were five, four, three. I don't know what, but they were babies, you know. I'm sure you got started in gymnastics when you were just a little tyke, right? Yeah. And then I moved away from home at 13. I moved into the Olympic Training Center at 13. Um, my parents were in Florida. It was up in D.C. at the time outside of DC and Maryland, I moved into one of the training centers. And so I've, I've kind of been on my own since 13. I'm fiercely independent, but uh, yeah, it, it becomes your whole life. You know, you don't go to school like the other kids do. You don't uh, like you did. You had to be up early and you probably swam in the morning before school, swam after, after school. I did, we had stretch and strength in the morning. Then we'd go to school for a few hours. We'd train all afternoon. We didn't do, you know, there was no dating in high school. There was no chances or football games. The first time I went to a football game, I was working in television and they asked me to go cover a Friday night, like high school football thing. And uh, I actually, that was my first time ever going to a high school football game was as a journalist. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. It's, I want, I want to bring something up. Actually, I didn't expect this to happen, but I'm, I'm really thrilled that, that it's, it's come through. So when I'm, when I'm get, delivering a resilience keynote talk, Often I will make references, you know, we're all storytellers. You're you're a keynote speaker and you're in front of the public a lot as I am. And mm-hmm. people to gas to grasp any concept, but certainly, you know, not just an a, an ordinary concept. If you're trying to sort of spin something uh, differently, turn it on its head, create a new paradigm, help people to just get a new insight, you really have to you have to sink a lot of that. Uh, deeply and and storytelling is just one of the greatest ways to do that, right? It's the thing that people can remember. L- for more than a year now, I've been talking about Simone Biles. I don't use it in every single um, event, but I, I bring it up where it feels appropriate to talk about what she modeled at the Olympics in in the, I guess it was a year ago this, this past summer. Um, 2021, yeah, like it was a weird year. I mean, yeah, exactly. It was still sort of pandemic and Japan was somehow able to put on a delayed version <laughs> of the yeah. Olympic Games. Right. Um, and and I thought it was pretty uh, astounding what she did. I mean, it was clearly controversial for folks just to catch up. If you don't know, Simone Biles, she took herself out of the meet um, right at the start of, of the of this meet. And Simone Biles, again, for those of you that don't know, you know, Simone is like, you just have to say Simone. She's like Michael Jordan, just have to say the first word, first name, and everybody gets it. You know, and she's she's just one of the one of the greatest Olympic athletes, gymnasts that's ever ever been. Um and and I think the world was shocked and a lot of people were shocked and a lot of people became critical. And then a lot of people also came to her aid because she had at that moment, as I understand it, um, was was just not fully there mentally, emotionally, physically, but spiritually, perhaps she just wasn't at her best. Had something described as the twisties. I didn't know what the twisties were, but basically, you know, like you could tell us uh, better. In fact, um, let me add, let's let's start this conversation about Simone. I have a a certain through line I want to get to with it. But so, w- what's your take on what happened um, to Simone? couple of summers ago when she had the quote twisties. Yeah, I'm a huge fan uh, of her as a person and as an athlete. And I would say not just one of the best gymnasts of all times, one of the best Olympic athletes of all times. Um, She's really quite something. Uh, I, having been an athlete at that level, and and I've, I defend this often because I'm in a world of athletes uh, often. Um, And I think that it's very different for people to think about if you get the yips in baseball, they call it. My first husband played pro ball. Um, and, and in golf, yips. too. They call it the yips. Or in golf, you can get the yips. Um, or in any sport, you could just not be on your game. But if you do that, you don't get die. You don't paralyze yourself or die if you get the yips. If you don't know where you are and like your brain's not 
connecting to your, like your, the stuff that you don't have to think about all that stuff that runs in the back of your head when you're in the middle of it. You don't think about how high you lift your arms and when you twist and when you come out of that, your brain just knows it. And if you are in a moment where like nothing's connecting, you can really hurt yourself or you can kill yourself. It's that, and the stuff that she does, she could do very much bodily harm and, and, you know, put herself in a position that's super dangerous. So uh, I think the fact that she was um, strong enough to realize that that is what was going on with her body. I've only happened happened, happened to be twice the whole time I was an athlete and I was a gymnast for many years. Um, I remember once as a very young gymnast in the middle of a twist, just opening up. I remember it because I knocked my coach who was co who was spotting me. I knocked him in the face. And, and then I had one other time where I did it uh, in a vault, which I think is where she was having that experience too. And you're way up in the air. And if, if your kinesthetic awareness, like you don't know where the ground is and like you're just lost. It is like cold chills through your whole body. You don't, there, it's hard to even explain what that feels like. You know, you don't know, you have no idea what's going to happen next. Usually you're so sure. It's just second nature. You've been doing this your whole life. Yes. Like you go up in the air, you spin, you flip, you know where the ground is. Like you don't think about it. It just is. Um, it's really like chillingly frightening. And it. I can't explain it more than that, but it's it's something that unless you've experienced it, um, it's really, it's difficult to explain. But I, I have great respect for her because so many athletes would be like, I can get over this or and, and you just can't. It's like like something's disconnecting. Yeah. So I I don't know. I defend her a lot. It's not like getting the yips in a, or having a problem in another sport where you're just not going to win. You're going to hurt yourself, and it's not going to be small. It's not going to be a small injury. Terrifying. Things I mean, that she does. I, I met it. It's a, this is a, this is something maybe most people that are listening to this have never heard me say before. So this is something I'll answer the question. What's something? <laughs> <laughs> people don't know about you that you want them to know. I mean, I guess I want them to know this now. Um, I met my, my beautiful wife, Randy, uh, a long time ago in our, in a child psychology class at university of Massachusetts at Amherst. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a sophomore. She was a freshman. I was coming to that class. And the reason we met was because I had to borrow a pen and I picked up pretty quickly that I could borrow the same pen from her every single day, which, you know, <laughs> there is, there's a lot more than 10. It, it's, it's a few, it's, it's a couple of decades, more than a couple of decades later that we're together with, you know, four kids and stuff. So I guess it was a good decision. Yeah. I didn't have a pen legitimately the first time because I was coming from gym class. I had a very tough class right before this intro psychology class, which was trampoline. And oh, yeah. so I had a trampoline class and I was learning in that class how to do back summies, not just from the trampoline, but from the mat. Yeah. So I'll never forget at some point we were out walking in town and I said, you know what? I can do a back summy now. And it was nighttime. We were on grass, just walking in like a quad or something. And I said, watch this. I'm going to do a back summy. No. And I did what you just described. Like I threw my arms back, my body went up. I completely started to think about what mm -hmm. it was going to be and froze, opened up and landed like on my neck. And good oh. thing I didn't like, you know, really Thank F goodness. myself up. What's that? Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was super. Um, it was it was a, a pivotal moment, I think, for her as a leader. And I consider her very much a leader, Simone, not just of that team, but uh, across the globe uh, as as a, a an athlete as a woman, as, as a, a person um, who is, has, has done some and continues to do amazing things with her life to take a step back in that moment to say, I'm on pause here. I'm taking myself out of this meet was really profound because I feel like she took a step by, uh, uh, took a step back even in the midst of that criticism. And then a week later, as folks may recall, the story goes, you know, she, got back in the meet. She was able, you know, so in that interim period, other other gymnasts were able to step up because she stepped back. And yeah. in fact, I forget the name of one of the gymnasts, but somebody else won a silver medal that wouldn't have even been in the meet had it not been for the fact that Simone took herself out, which was, again, thinking about not just her own safety, but but the success of the team as well. And a week later, she puts herself back in the meet and gets on the balance beam and wins like a bronze medal, which was what she won in, in Rio, I think as well, which is to me, 
for all I you you tell me I want to know what you think is the what what was the hardest event for you I can't even picture everything I see but to do that on a balance beam is mm-hmm. just insane yeah <laughs> right it was that the toughest event for you I always say I, floor was my best event because you can't fall off it <laughs> because you can't fall off it right beam was very difficult beam was one of my top events as well but um bars was what I was the weakest on um yeah beam is just a, it's a head game you know that's like putting it's it's a lot of it's in your head when you're on the beam so she yeah. comes you want back to do another golf analogy yeah right she comes back into the meet to get into the head game of the beam and then wins a medal for her country yeah. um but i think it was profound because when we think about resilience which is the conversation you and i are going to have today um, I thought she just demonstrated and modeled this so perfectly in a world where people are exhausted and people are depleted. And they think because it's been the training and the programming from the past, from other people, from their culture, even where they grew up. A lot of people all over the world believe that there's points, there's extra points to grind it out. Somehow you get extra, you know, extra points in heaven for being, you know, for <laughs> just gritting it out, right? Right. She was a great demonstration of she took a step back so she didn't have to have a setback. And, right. and that was profound, I think, as an example for all of us, because not only did she get to recharge and, and recover, but then she was able to get in and do something really valuable for her, for her country and for herself as well. So I would love to start this conversation with your personal definition of what resilience is and what it, it looks like for you. Yeah, well, you you hit the nail on the head right there. Um, and and well, my the the, uh, the definition of resilience that I use is from Center of Resilience. It's um, the ability to learn and grow stronger and adapt in a positive way when something happens in your life. It's that adapt in a positive way that I really lean into when I'm speaking and talking and thinking. Um, and it's the adapt piece. I mean, there are a lot of people who speak on grit and and persistence. And I believe in those things have a place, but during the pandemic, when everybody couldn't like just double down and go hard, we, everybody had to go, oh, that's why this word resilience is so important. Cause I have to actually adapt in a, po- I have to figure out how to adapt in a positive way to what's going on. Cause I can't just double down or go harder or, or, you know, grind my way through this. So that's the definition that I use. And the piece that adapt in a positive way is really key for me. And you hit the nail on the head when you said this long-term um, so I, I talk a lot about, uh, you know, lifetime learning and, and future success. So that adapt in a positive way is how you get to future success. Life changes. Everybody has challenges. Some people are a lot bigger than others, but everybody has challenges. And your ability to adapt and get, find success on the other side has a lot to do with how you handle those, the this is, I call them. We can get into that later. But this long-term success is, is when you can see you know, a future where the things that you want are are coming into play and you can take yourself out of it or make an adjustment. So you have this long-term success. Here's a fun thing. I do this lifetime timeline. And um, if you think about Simone, since we just talked about her, so she's now 20 something. She's not, you know, she's, she's young. So I'll I'll use my own life because I know my own math and I'm not a math whiz and it would take me a minute to do her math. So when I lost my sport, I was 19. 19. Okay. When I was 19 years old. Okay. That that event in my life, gymnastics had been 78% of everything I'd known in my life. 78%. That point. And when I was 50 and I look back, like that was less than like 20, I think 26% of my life. And if I live to be 100, it's going to be even smaller. So that percentage of how big, it, of course, it feels huge in the moment. But if you look at the lifetime um, and being resilient for a lifetime and continuing to adapt in a positive way as your life throws challenges and changes at you. That's that long-term thinking um, that we get into. One of the things that I like to share is uh, this fun thing that actually an old boyfriend brought up to me, but it's, uh, and I'll talk about it in my book. Imagine when you're 10, remember summer when you were 10 and and like, it, it just felt like the longest time in the world when you're 10 years old and summer's just stretched out in front of you, like all this time and you have to wait two weeks to go to summer camp and stuff. Like summer is big when you're 10. And then when you're 40, maybe you have a 10 year old and like summer comes and you're like, where'd it go? It came and went so fast. You know, it's the same thing. When you're 10, that year of your life, that whole year is one tenth of everything you know. So of course it seems huge. But when you're 40, it's one fortieth of the same 365 days, but the math totally works against us. And that's why it seems like life is going so fast, I think. 
So just a fun mind game to think about. And when I think about Simone, back to her, I mean, this was a point in her life. She has a huge, amazing life ahead of her. She's going to do so many fantastic things outside of gymnastics. I mean, she's going to be a force to be reckoned with for a lifetime. Um, And that was a moment that she didn't have to uh, take herself in a really bad place. So there you go. That's my thought on that. Or for, I could ramble all day. Or force it. And and what's really, again, just to stay on that for one more second, you know, it, it's the world is looking at her. It, you think about our decisions in life where we've, 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 where we made a mistake or we failed at something or, or whatever the case might have been, or we made a, a difficult decision. It's not like you literally had the cameras of the world on you and right. analyzing and analyzing in real time. You know, whether you were a, a quitter or whether you were brave or, you know, what does this, you know, what did this mean? I mean, it, it's just quite a, a surreal experience to imagine being in her, in literally in her shoes at that moment. Yeah. And to have the courage to do what she did uh, was just, a, again, a great learning lesson because so often it is that I run into people with our, we have a resilient leader assessment that we typically um, use as, as part of our, our process before, when we're getting ready to deliver a workshop or a keynote. And, and more than 5,000 people across the globe and business leaders mostly have taken this assessment. And the scores are, are, are really quite uh, shocking in so many respects. They're baked into four zones, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. But people so often, the one thing that's consistent across those things is that people try to to just force things. They're they're exhausted and depleted in part because they're trying so hard. And and I'm a I'm not a, a I don't lack in tenacity <laughs> or persistence, but it's just it's what you said, Nina. You know, there's an element of that that is like we're making a a, a cake or something and there's an ingredient that's called persistence or an ingredient mm-hmm. called tenacity or grit. It is yeah. it is certainly not the most uh, it is is not the number one ingredient. It's not the most, uh, you know, prevalent. It's not the one thing you're going to taste more than anything else in that cake. But yet people think that's the case, mm-hmm. and and so you know we drum it into people's heads not to quit. And yet we're living in a world where there's a term called quiet quitting now. Right. You know, on the back or on the other side of the the great resignation or the great attrition. I mean, like. There's something in the marketplace that we're being told about the paradigm that people have been living when it comes to this this thing that we're calling being resiliency. Um, I'd love to just get your take on that. What what do you what do you think the reason is, or is there a collection of things that you say would have contributed to this this uh, prevalence of people resigning or people that are quietly quitting and 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 I mean something other than what we've heard, which is it's those uh, you know millennials or Gen Zs that just don't have any backbone or whatever it is that that you hear older folks sometimes say about that those generations. Yeah, well, I probably qualify as older folks, but I don't think it's the millennials or the Gen Zs. I think um, you know it's it's part of what you said. It's, it has to do with the way in which we look at the word quit. Uh, And if we think about uh, resilience as adapt in a positive way to change, we all went through this big change and we had time to sit back and rethink our lives. So I think the great, I mean, the the great resignation is not coming from, I don't like my work anymore or my bosses. I don't want to go back and sit in an office. I think that as a collective unit, every generation, friends of mine who are in their fifties, who are still in corporate America, who are vice presidents and CEOs, I have the same conversation with them. They're like, I just had time to sit and think and I'm, I, I, I feel like I need to be doing something different. Uh, I feel like the world has changed and I need to make a change. So I think the word quit is, uh, we've got a bad taste in our mouth for it, but we're just choosing to do something else. Um, This quiet quit, people are looking for other things while they're trying to figure it out. Uh, I think that as as a, not just as a nation, because this is global, we all went through this pandemic for the first time in history. Like, Remember, I used to have everybody had a 9-11 story, like you could say how that changed your life and everybody you'd go to a party and like, I know where I was and everybody has their story. Um, this is global. The whole world you know, like went through these, we could say the stages of grief and went through this you know, big change, this big this, I call it. But on the other side of it, 
I think we all had so much time to sit and think about what was important to us. We looked at things differently because the world was different. We looked at things that we thought were important because some of the things we thought were really important went away. I mean, I'm a public speaker. Conferences went away. Like that was a big part, like standing in front of audiences of thousands of people. Like that went away. So I had time to think and go, wow, what, what's my message without that? How can I help and make a difference on the planet that I thought I was trying to do if there's not that? So did I quit and go and do something else? Some people, I didn't. I, I waited until it, you know, I did my, I, I adapted and then got back on that same horse. But other people adapted and chose to go in new directions. And some people are still figuring it out and they're quietly quitting while they figure it out. Um, you know, p- some people are still in a little bit of denial, like, wait, I went to college for this. Yeah. I got a career in this. I worked my whole life to get to this point in my career. And like, now what? Like they're, so everybody's on their own journey, every generation. And I, I think this quiet quit is just a lot of people who are still thinking through that and are, or don't want to actually quit because they've been told not to be a quitter. So they're trying to figure out what to do without quitting because that's a bad thing. Um, and and maybe, or maybe they can't find the next thing. They're just stuck in this in-between, yeah. you know, they're like in the upside down. I don't know. They're, they haven't quite figured out uh, uh, stranger uh, things. Uh, I'm just, literally. They're quit. like, they're just stuck in this place where they haven't made a decision yet. I think that's what the quiet quit is. And I think it's going to be years before people come out and figure out exactly mentally and you know how this how this whole experience has changed them yeah it, it's really it's a lot of things and two of the things that came up for me when I was listening to you speak about it um I think are, are really important one is is something actually and this is a a shameless plug for for the book pivot right that I yeah. that I wrote some everybody years ago. hated that word during the pandemic so it's so fun that's the name of it. it it is well this book came out in 2016 this is the soft cover re yeah. re uh issue of this from Simon Schuster which came out last year which was great because we were able to update the content to to speak to things that we learned in the pandemic but but and yeah, I wish only had a nickel for every time the word pivot was appearing uh, somewhere. Um, there's a chapter in this book that talks about the sunk cost fallacy um, in that in that uh, book. And I think there's an element of that where people do feel like they've got so much time in on something, you know, so much time doing something or schooling that they that they paid for or student loans. They're still indebted to. <laughs> You know, time they were away from their children to get to that point in their career. I mean, yeah, along with the student loans and the college and the, all of it. And that's all collectively kind of referred to as a sunk cost. Mm-hmm. And people think that somehow or another there is a sunk cost to things which doesn't enable them to then make a change to pivot, right. et cetera. Um, I want to I want to get into the, the the nitty gritty of your of your story, because you already indicated to us that you had a dis- an early life disappointment. Um, serious one in that you spent 78% of your time focused on becoming an Olympic athlete. And by age 16 or 17, you you didn't make the team. So then you go to college and have an injury and the, that sport, I'm assuming we're still talking about gymnastics at 19, you, you lost your sport to quote what you said yeah. earlier, you know, and I, again, just that is, that is a major pivotal point there, but that's not, the end of those kinds of roads that you get to a place where it's either, you know, the road has changed um, or there's a dead end or you changed on, you know, intentionally changed your path. I'd love to have you track a few of those for us. Sure. Um, I call them my this is. So there's the capital T, capital H, capital I, capital S. Those are the big ones that take your life in a new direction and I have five of those in my life where I really like lifetime of planning and going in a direction and had a plan and a path I was on. And then something happened that I couldn't, th- there was nothing I could do to get back on that track. Something was going to have to change. Those are big thises we all have, like um, getting fired, your company going under or or getting divorced or getting a, a horrible diagnosis or a death in the family. Like those are big thises. And then there are these capital T-H-I-S's that like take us off track for a little while, but we can actually get back to the goal we had. Um, and then the little thises are the ones we handle every day, you know, like spill coffee on yourself and you got to, you know, go change your outfit to get out the door. Or your kid's school calls in the middle of a big meeting and you had to deal with it. Like those are the little ones. But these big thises, um, I had some big ones. So the first two you mentioned, not making the Olympic team and 
just the devastation around that and and the embarrassment. I just thought I was a failure and the shame and all of that that went back with having to go back. My family who'd sacrificed and my friends who had all been talking about it. I mean, it was like morning announcements in high school, embarrassing, like, bleh. And then, you know, then I had to go through to college and blowing out my knee in college. We have a lot of athletes who go through this, even without blowing, even out without an injury, they just lose their sport at the end of their career because there's no place to go play professionally. And back then it was like my bumper sticker and like my sweatshirts and like my bumper sticker on my car, my sweatshirts and stuff. Nowadays, it's your Instagram, it's your Facebook, it is out there. It is very much your identity and how you identify. So to lose that at the end of a, a, a long athletic career is very difficult to figure out who you are without that sport, having given your whole life to that sport. So that was a struggle. Um, and then I did find my way out of that. I had, you know, took me, I didn't make all the right choices, but uh, I made some, thank goodness. And I found journalism and I became a, a journalist. I became a reporter and then a news anchor. And I loved doing that. It was put all my energy and passion into it. It was very successful. Um, and then at one point in my career, I literally won like Charleston's favorite. I'm in Charleston, South Carolina at the time. And I won Charleston's favorite news anchor for seven years in a row. Like everybody loves Nina. And the next day I get called into the boss's office, the, the general manager's office. And uh, they literally handed me a box and let me go. And uh, I was just nationwide, you know, budget cuts. Now that I've worked in a big company and I realize you have to do force ranking and look at everybody's numbers and make some hard decisions. I was a hard decision they made. But they let me go like the day after I won this big. I thought I was going in to get a, a like a, a bonus or something. Totally, totally, you know, nailed me up the side of the head with that one. But they handed me a box and said, thank you for your 10 years. with Wait, this just TV Pause season. right there. I just want everybody to just sit with that for just a second. Literally, wherever you are in this moment, just sit with what that that feels like. Because we all probably have known something like that. But that's a pretty big deal because not just because it's like it's it's a. Uh, a, a position of some importance, but you're out in the public. So you're Very literally, public. so one day you're sitting behind the desk and you're this news anchor that people love. And the next yeah. day there's somebody else sitting in your seat behind that desk. Yeah. They went younger and blunder. It was cheaper. So that just did. But what was really weird. And I'll tell you, um, uh, I talked about this in my first book. So they handed me this box and walked me out. And I said, have I done something wrong? They said, no, I said, you know, do I have, we talked about my non-compete. There was all these things around it. But then I, I walked out of the station and I didn't know what to do because I had done three shows a day for more than like 10 years at this point. And so I had a, a sitter at home with the kids. I had two small children and a husband. I was a breadwinner. I like, I had two small children and a husband at, uh, who was still at work at the time. So like they were with the nanny. And then I, di I didn't want to go home. I wasn't ready to see kids yet, but I, I couldn't really go out anywhere because everybody would have been like, wait, why aren't you doing the news? And I didn't know what to say. So I drove, my parents lived in the same town. They moved here when, my, when I had small children. Um, and I drove to my mom's house and took a pair of her sneakers. They weren't home. Took a pair of her sneakers out of her um, closet. And they were like a size too small. And I put them on and I went and walked on the beach for like an hour, like trying to like cry and laugh and figure it out. Like just what am I going to do? I had no idea, but I just didn't know what to do with myself because I, I wasn't ready to answer any questions to anybody and of course they you know part of my deal was you can't tell anybody we let you go we have to say we parted ways amicably and then we'll pay you that's how they you know well so, that's yeah. how they get you to sign the the release agreement right I mean, you know. but I, so I ended up right. sitting on the beach for six months and hanging out with my kids until I went across the street and got a job at the other tv station but at first it was it's so devastating I mean it just such as out of left field and I thought about quitting you know, I thought, how am I, how did I get to this point? Did I waste all this time? Just like we all do. Was this a waste of time? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's that soul, soul moment, like a searching and, yeah. and, a, and a evaluating. <laughs> I mean, yeah. there's a lot, a lot of things involved in that. I've taken that walk, Nina. I know what that walk feels like. I know what, the, <laughs> I know what the drive, the, in particular, the drive feels like Yeah. when, when your vision and for for something doesn't isn't isn't aligned with someone else's vision who has more power. In and it's that, a lonely in the, moment. In that moment, it's an incredible. It's because it's your dream. It's nobody else's. It's no, your no, dream it's and your goal. Dream. Your ego. It's your own stuff. It's I left. Own. I left the law in a very lucrative pra practice I built over eighteen years to pursue a dream, which is really what that book Pivot was about. And and 
to then also come to that moment when someone else held the cards to say, well, you can still pursue your dream, but it's not, it's not going to be here. It's not going to be with us. Yes. It's not going to be great this- and all, but bye-bye. Yeah. So that's, that's a, that's a lonely moment for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and one of the greatest moments, I mean, so I want it to be about you. Uh, people, people may already know my story or not, but you know, what was it like to come out of that moment? Cause I know for me, it was, it was, as I look back on it, not just pivotal, but just one of the greatest moments of growth and not necessarily the growth I would have chosen. All right. To be like really honest about it. Um, but I wouldn't now change any part of that. So yeah. how do, how do you feel about that now? Looking yeah, at? it was a gift. I'd probably still be in that job. I'm, re- I'm fiercely loyal and I would have probably just stayed yeah. here and done that same job forever. And it was, it ended up being a gift. I had time to you know, be a parent to my kids in a way that I hadn't. I had two little ones at the time. Um, I think they were like two and four, tiny. Um, and so I had a time ta- had time to spend time with them and think about the kind of parent I wanted to be, what I wanted my future to look like. I'd been so busy working, I hadn't done that. Home- that homework I hadn't done that work. Yeah. Um, I did go back into television. I decided I didn't want to move out of the area I lived in. I wanted to stay there, and I had this offer. It was half the money that I used to make. I mean, literally half. Uh, and I had, had been divorced. So I was like single parenting at the time. Like, how do I pull all this off? Yeah. It was, but I remember being in that house for a while. I had a new house um, well, about the same time this happened. And I was like painting murals on the kids' walls and cooking and like all the stuff no one has time to do when they work a full-time job. Right. So yeah. And like spending lazy days with them on the beach in the middle of the week going, oh, is this what it's like to actually just sit back and be a parent? So yeah. really valuable thinking. And I was fortunate enough that the other TV station in town had an opening um, and I was good friends with some folks over there. And they're like, come on over when your non-compete is done. And you um, won an and you won an Emmy, didn't you? After yeah. Then, yeah. Changing. So then I went back and I won an Emmy at the other TV station, just kind of as a. It's okay to stick it in just a little bit. You just know what? We're not perfect. So, no. you know. It, yeah, it's, I know. It's it was a, it was a little bit of a gotcha, but uh, yeah. So, but it, the learning that for me, um, it was one of those changes that was again not my doing, just like not losing my sport and other stuff. Yes. But I came out so glad for the change on the other side because I would have kept doing the same thing forever. I kind of think the universe keeps going. Okay, Nina, you figured this one out. Go do something else. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that I happened- mean, it- and, Same and, thing with my marriage. I went through a divorce, which just statistically, you've got listeners out there who've been through that one. That's a big this. One and in, that's the one same in thing. two, approximately, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. One, one and it's two. the same thing. It's the yeah. end of the dream that you had, like all the dreams that you put in place when you went down that path and put a lot of you know, time and energy and resources and emotion into that. So yeah. some big ones. And, and then the last one. Hmm? Yeah. I was just going to say that the sunk cost thing also applies there because there are people who are in marriages. And again, I want to say as a disclaimer here, this is not a call to action for anybody to go right. get divorced. Okay. I know everybody, you know, when we, when we make decisions, sometimes it's just the littlest thing that comes sometimes can be that thing. It's mm-hmm. always meant to hear that today kind of thing. So I just want to, this may or may not be that moment. Um, but, but we do tolerate a great deal in our lives. And sometimes we tolerate mediocrity. We tolerate things that we know don't work or that there really is no future for, but we, we tolerate it for the usual, you know, the usual reasons, security, safety, right. The fear of the unknown and all that kind of stuff. Um, So we, we can pivot by design or sometimes the universe handles our pivots for us. Right. Right. Um, So you had, you had one of those, but so, so then the marriage ended and then, but that's not even the end of the story of your pivot. Oh no, I have one more and, and I won't go deep into it, but I was um, very, again, I was back on TV and I was very public. And then I was involved in a car accident in which I was the driver. Um, and it was the middle of the day. It wasn't a drunk driving thing or anything, but I was the driver in this accident. And I went through a really, and it was truly an accident, ruled an accident. Um, but I tr- went down a very dark place uh, because I was so public. And now I was this person who had been involved in this thing. Um, and there's a lot to it. It's a lot, very heavy uh, that we can talk about maybe, a, or you can read my book. It's in there. Uh, but it was a really difficult time for me to dig back out and figure out who I was there. And I had a moment where I didn't even want my timeline to go on. Like I couldn't figure out 
Like, I don't want this to be part of who I am. After I was like, everybody's favorite news anchor and this world-class athlete, like everybody loves Nina. I didn't want that to be part of my story. So I went through a really difficult time to figure out how I put this in my brain and made it part of who I am. Uh, and that was probably the the biggest, that's what's a lot of it sent me down this new path. That's one. And I went back on TV, very public, stayed on TV for a year, but then I got out and got into tech. And I will tell you that resilience piece, having gone through that journey um, and good therapist and all those things, uh, I'm big into stoicism, cognitive behavior therapy. It's kind of a mix of those things, you know, in my brain. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I, I will tell you going through that journey made me sort of bulletproof on the other side. By the time I got into tech and was working in a SaaS company and learning something new and really diving into that, you know, we were running, you know, doing this road show and doing the IPO about eight years into that journey. And um, other people were just falling like flies. It was very difficult. It's a very difficult time. Grown men, like in tears, like I can't do this. And I was just like, totally do this. Like, come on, I got you. Let's go just move, move the, move the, you know, move the things forward because I had been through such tough stuff. This didn't seem that difficult to me. Yeah. So there's something about that resilience piece. And I talk about it. Um, if you can picture a, a heartbeat, you know, an EKG going up and down, you know, yeah. like the downs are those low parts that the, this is and the top parts are the stuff you're happy about. And that's just life. It goes up and down. That's how it works. And you wouldn't want a flat line anyway. You know, some people have lower lows and higher highs, but every time you get back above the line, you know, you have a down. Every time you get back above the line, you're a little stronger. So yeah. that concept about for me. The stoicism. Big. How does the stoicism inform that? Because it feels like there's a there's an element of a philosophy, really, that you're talking about, right? Yeah, I'm um, I'm a little nerdy geeky when it comes to stoicism. Marcus Aurelius, I wear this says Amor Fate. I wear it around my neck. Um, wow. I I do. Uh, and I think none of it's new. What I'm telling you, none of it's new. I just reframe things in a way that somebody might hear it differently. Plato said, all learning is remembering, yeah. right? Yeah. This, none yeah. of this so, is new, right? We get so that. My fun thing is like Marcus Aurelius said this stuff back in the day. And then we had Emerson. I'm also a big Emerson fan. What mm -hmm. lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. I wear that on a bracelet on my arm most days. So a big Emerson fan. That's my favorite quote. But I'm also, so Marcus Aurelius, and then comes along Emerson saying the same thing in different ways. And then Dr. Seuss, if you go through, Dr. Seuss has almost all of the same things as well, just right. said in a different way. So uh, I, I call it stoicism. It sounds real fancy, but it's just uh, the same stuff people have been saying for years about mm -hmm. how you can think about the world around you and how you you know react when something happens or how you look at the world and you use your own thinking to create, you know, the, the future that you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's fate, a personal, this is, it's a amor personal... fate, like uh, love fate. It, it is. That's, that's very much the, the life that I've chosen to embrace. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I'm putting the word for me, I'm putting the word philosophy on it because I think to your, you, my personal philosophy is, is vitally important to my attitude to my outlook yeah. to the to the adaptability that you mentioned earlier my capacity to adapt to the world as it is and the world as it is won't be the world as it is in a minute fr from now in a second and that's the thing that we i don't know that we're we're really um brought up to 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 embrace in fact i think we're brought up to embrace quite the opposite that we're constantly sort of attaching ourselves to things, wanting them to stay the same and and um, and being resistant to change and and um, and forcefully often, like resisting it, but with a lot of energy, which depletes us further, um, you, you know, ultimately changes the, the law of manifestation in the universe. So to resist that is literally to resist life itself on some level. And yeah, I and think that's self defeating. Yeah, and they, the best laid plans. I mean, you can have wonderful intentions when you get married. You can have amazing plans when you start a company. Like no one, it, it, things happen. The world, nobody planned for a pandemic. It happened. So your ability to, when something happens, adapt in a positive way to whatever that is, and I call it your ability to handle the this is. You know how you how you handle the this is is directly related to your level of success and happiness 
in the future? Because your success is a, is a scary word. It's kind of like quit. It's one of those words that's been thrown at us a lot. Yeah. But my definition of success and your definition of success and someone else's may be very different. So when I say success, I'm talking about whatever your you know, goal or your, and goals, even setting goals, goals change. Like you, you can't, we've been told so much to set these goals. Even goals can change over time. You can change your mind. You know, I had a thing and um, I actually talk about this quite a bit too. My kids, I put all three months through college and I paid for everything because I didn't have, you know, I had a scholarship and that's how I had to get, you know, had to have that to get through school. So that was a thing with me. I would pay for wherever they go. So all three went to college and I said, here's two rules. One, you can't get anybody pregnant or get pregnant because I want you to finish with a clean slate and be able to do whatever you want to do. I just, so uh, if, if you do that, then money train stops. And then two, no tattoos, no tattoos on your body. Don't commit to something before you're going to finish with college. You have to get through college without writing it on your body because there's something about that commitment that they feel like they now set that goal. They have to go do it. Like you have to stick to this thing. So, uh, I said, and it's just clean slate. I just wanted them to clean slate on the other side of college. And those were my rules and my thing, but it was my way of giving them the the the, the grace or giving them encouragement to change. Like if you change your mind about your major, change it. If you change your mind, that you, you have this time in your life before you're a certain age and even at any point in your life to change because you choose to go in a new direction. And I didn't want them to feel like they were so committed to something that they couldn't, you know, they had to stick to it or be persistent. I just, I, I, I'm not against those words, but I do think if you want to live a really full and rich life, there are sometimes you have to change. We change as humans, the world around us changes, you know, I mean, I was back with bag phones. Like, remember bag phones? I was a reporter with a bag phone and a radio, listen to the police radio. Who would know that it was all be in my pocket? Like, you don't even have to watch the news anymore. It's one of the reasons I got out of television. Like, no one's going to watch local news. Some people still do. I, I have many friends who still work in the business. I love them and I love, you know, that industry. But most of the time, people have all of it in their pocket. They sure. don't even need it. So anyway, change. I had this whole thing around, it's okay to change. It's a, you know, don't don't feel like because you said one thing once, you have to stay with it forever. Yeah, I mean, it really is amazing that, and it's a bit of an oxymoron because the one, the, the greatest constant it's in changed. all of life is change. Yes. <laughs> so change is constant. Like it's like you go, what? These are seemingly. So it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Yeah. In, inconsistent, you know, or incompatible even. And they're not. That's where I think we have to understand what what is vitally, um, not just what is true, capital T, truth, that that's the case. But what is our philosophy around it? You know, personally, do we see success as something that that means avoiding failure? Because a lot of people, I think that's their philosophy, that to be successful, I have to avoid failure. Or does someone like you, my, me, and many, many other people that we know who've succeeded multiple times and continue to to achieve whatever the outer, you know, the, the external world or would define as success, that success is really about how we leverage our failures. Right. How do we utilize our failures? Because that's, again, philosophic, but that philosophy then, it directs us in in so much of our thinking and so much of our actions. Um, so I, I want to mention your book right here. This is not the end is the, is the title of it. Yeah. Yeah. This is not the end. And it's, it looks like a typewriter on the front that says the end, you know? Like the I end of the story. It. This yeah. is not the end. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. That's the right, uh, the right, uh, yes. I, I didn't stress it in the right spot. So no, but it's, it's strategies to get you through the worst chapters of your life. And it's a little bit of my story, but a whole lot more about the reader and whatever they're going, whatever their big this is that they're going in. This, whatever you're going through is yep. not the end of your story. And I just help people. It's the book I was looking for when I went through a really difficult time. I, it's, mm. I call it an airplane read. It's an hour and 10 minutes or so to, from beginning to end. And it's it's hard to write a short book, is what I realized, because uh, it took me a long time to get it down to something that was consumable for someone who's going through a difficult time. Yeah. But that's what it's designed for. Um, so yeah. in the show notes for, for today's conversation, you guys will find links to have um, find out more about this is not 
the end, as well as um, where it is that you can get a hold of Nina and find out more about her amazing message, her keynote speaking, all the ways in, in which she is serving uh, the world. I have so loved our conversation today, Nina. I so appreciate your time and and going there and going there. I don't know how much of, of what you shared with us is something, you know, are things that you don't share typically. I mean, I feel like that one little piece where you 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 told us about what it was like to leave the leave the studio um and not not be ready to head home and and just hug and kiss your kids as though nothing had changed or nothing was wrong that is that is a very um visceral moment and and uh vulnerable and i personally can identify with what that drive feels like and and i think we all can i mean on to greater or lesser extent um, so I appreciate you going there with us today. My pleasure. It's been really it zoomed. The time zoomed by. It's been just great to chat with you and spend a little time with you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, we'd love to get your comments as always. You can go to adammarkell.com forward slash podcast, leave a comment there for me. And I will actually be the one responding. We don't have bots doing that. Nobody else is doing it for me. <laughs> um, and not because we don't have a team to do it, but it's just, to me, it's not, it's a personal thing. If you take the time to do that, I want to be the one personally responding to you. Um, we also make the request that if there's somebody that you think would really benefit from hearing more about Nina's story, hearing any of the parts of this conversation, uh, feel free to share. We love it when you do that. Share the episode, share um, something uh, you know with a friend or family member, somebody in, in business right now is dealing with the concept of change and you know maybe they, they could um, you know get some strength from this or some insight as well. And of course, those five-star reviews uh, on the platform that you consume this podcast on, really just, it's a blessing. We appreciate it, you taking the time to do that. So thank you so much for that as well. And speaking of blessings, I, I feel like this has been a blessing to all of us today, Nina. And I just, again, want to say thank you for your time. Adam, thank you so much. And that's why you're so good, Adam, is because you do answer all those yourself and you do this as a passion. So I am honored to be a part of it and really appreciated the time we had today. Yay. Way cool. Ciao for now, everybody. Okay, so just in full transparency, folks, this is a, this is an edit. Um, typically, my conversations with people are not edited. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but uh, but in this instance, as as we had closed out, Nina and I were having a conversation, and she had said to me, "Hey, listen, I I paused on on sharing a particular story because I didn't know whether your audience would would handle it or you would want me to share it or you know just." Just good old fashioned professionalism and uh, and courtesy, really. Um, and in discussing it, I just feel like you know this is something you guys would want to know and and hear. And Nina is willing to go there with us. So uh, so Nina, I'm going to toss this back to you. And uh, if you could just pick us up at that point where um, where you said you had an accident. Yeah, and I sort of high level that I've been in an accident and went through a difficult time. But the story of the accident, what had happened was, I, I'd already shared with you, I was now anchoring at a new TV station. I was best friends with my co-anchor and his whole family. Our kids were all the same age. And so I had taken a day off of work from the news so I could be like all the other moms, you know, grass is always greener. You know, I want to go home and meet the school bus because everybody else gets to. And so I took a day off of doing the news uh, and I went and met the school bus and I show up and got there early because the bus came to my co-anchor's house. He and his wife lived on a big corner lot in a very suburban neighborhood. You can picture it. It was fall, gorgeous out. And the bus comes, you know, when we, we I got there early and we'd been playing with their, they, they had a new baby about 11 months old. We've been playing with their new baby. who's adorable. She had two older boys and they were all just the best looking kids and just sweet, sweet, sweet family. And so the, the bus comes and the kids, you could hear it coming around the corner, you know, with all the, the noise and the kids all pile off and our boys were in the third grade and they throw their backpacks and want to run around. And um, there's probably, I don't know, probably 10, 15 kids that get off the bus right there. So all the moms and all the siblings, it was, it's a big party every afternoon and it was so great. I loved it. And then we all go to leave and uh, I pile mine in the car and like buckling in. How are you guys? You know, how was your day? And in the commotion of everybody gathering up their kids and going in different directions, no one had noticed that my co-anchor baby, my sweet friend's baby had crawled under my car and I backed up. And in that moment, obviously everything changed. Now, I, I will tell you, it was weeks and months before we knew if he would live, but he did survive. 
he was, he's great. He just turned 17 and he ran for class president at one point. My son coached his little league team. Uh, we got through this together. We held hands and walked down the hospital hall. My co-anchor and I, after weeks of like nobody doing the news, think about it. Uh, it was, it was very touch and go. So I was in a very dark place and he came, he was taking care of his wife in a dark place and this baby in the hospital and the weekend people had to do, you know, the morning show and the morning show people had to do the evening news. And it was just this big to do in our community. Um, that was just heartbreaking for everyone, but they were prayer vigils and we ended up going back on the air together uh, and, and showed the community how to lead with love. And we talked about him healing and we talked about his recovery and the amazing doctors. And we went down this journey together. Um, but that journey of, you know, went back on the air for a year together and, and he did heal. And then, and he became this wonderful young man and sort of a symbol of hope in our community as well. Uh, and, and that journey for me though, from everybody's favorite news anchor and this, you know, world-class athlete to the lady who was the one driving that car who ran over a baby in a horrible way to say it out loud. Um, it's never an easy story to tell, but the reality was that is what happened. And I was now the villain. I was now the bad guy and I didn't want to be that. And so I went through a really dark time uh, trying to figure out how do I go forward and create success on the other side of that? Like I, my, that was my biggest resilience journey. And it's one of the reasons I really went down this long-term resilience path and all the research that I did, because I was so strong on the other side of it. When I got into tech and had great success on the other side, people would be falling out when things got hard. And I was just bulletproof. Like, this isn't a big deal. Nothing phases me after that. And so I became this go-to person that people would come to and say, how do I get through this tough time? And that's when I stepped away from corporate, wrote a few books, and I, I I wanted to help more than one person at a time. I really wanted to put in writing, do the real research, figure out exactly what I had done in all of these instances, and put it in writing. How do you do that? How do you get out of a really dark place and not just survive, but use that new strength to create bigger success for you on the other side? So yeah. that's my really quick version of that. And it's oh never an easy, easy story to tell. Gosh, Nina, thank and thank you for for agreeing to stick around and and add that postscript to to our conversation. I'm glad we were able to do that because uh, we our our listeners are are amazing people. I get to hear from them often, and I just feel like there there was a sense there that that somebody would be like, yeah, why didn't why didn't why didn't we follow the follow the proverbial uh, breadcrumbs to that spot right there. Um, and I'm glad that we were able to come back and just do that. So the book is, This Is Not The End. And that book, um, again, is available where all the books are available that we we find them. And, uh, and of course, it'll be on the show notes. So again, um, Nina, thank you for coming back to share that. What What is something that almost just an unthinkable, you know, like a, a thing right. that nobody would really even consider how they would be, how they would show up, what it would look like for them or anyone around them in, in a circumstance as, as devastating as that. So, um, but you know that about yourself now, and, and now it's no surprise that people ask you to share what it looks like on the other side of that. So thank you. Yeah. And I, I, it can be triggery for some people, so I'm careful about sharing it. I also know that it's important to share because no matter how horrible the thing is that you're going through, your big this that you wake up and it takes up every inch of your brain and you can't function, whatever that big thing is that's taking up all of your energy. And like there is an other side to it. Um, the good stuff doesn't last forever, like when you have a win, but the bad stuff doesn't either. And no matter how bad it is, uh, you just keep going through that process. And I, I do like to share it because there's somebody out there that's in the middle of something that's horrible. Um, and even the really horrible stuff, uh, you can have a life after it. It just takes some time to figure out what that's going to look like. You, you can't not put it in the story of your life because you're going to be different, but you have to put it in there somehow and figure out who you're going to be on the other side of it. Yeah. I mean, there's, um, I guess the last thing that, that comes that I want to say about that is just that the, um, you know, there's that statement people always say, this too shall pass. It's a, it's a thing people say at funerals, right. I think, a lot of the time or in places like that, mm -hmm. um, in situations like that. And it it always felt a bit hollow to me that, you know, that statement. 
But what I realized some years ago is that it doesn't just go in the direction of the of these these awful moments in your life. It applies to everything. So yes. there's an element of gratitude that you can that you can also see because you know this too shall pass is the the best of things in your life, the best of moments, those 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 days that you want to hold on to again, attach the way we get attached to things, put it in a bottle, save it, et cetera. It's like that, that will pass, that will pass. And and this too shall teach as well. So it's, it's like, y- y- you're, you're going to learn, you're going to learn something that's valuable, not just for yourself, but for others. And, and if you, if you just have gratitude in the, in that transitory, the, the fact that nature is so, so, transitory it's changing so frequently that you know even pain will 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 be transmuted into joy and joy will then return to pain it's yeah. a beautiful cycle even though we don't want to we don't want to sit in pain i get it right um, and people can say this this too shall pass and i've heard that as well i always tell folks going through a difficult time um you're going to be okay i always lead with that hey you're going to be okay which people need to know but you're going to be different. You're going to be different. So it's not just that this is going to pass. You're going to be different on the other side of this. And that's all right. Yeah. It's all right. You can be different on the other side of this. You don't think that it's, you're, you're not going to fix it and put it all back in a bottle the way it was. You're going to be different on the other side of it. Um, and there's a, there's a you before this and there's a you after this thing happened yeah. and you'll get to the after and you'll be different, but you're going to be okay. Right. Different, yeah. different doesn't mean, doesn't mean worse. Right or bad right. or anything, right? It's just different. Yep, it's just yeah. different. It's just different. Yeah. Wow. So uh, the French, I feel like we we should finish with a flourish, like with a French <laughs> saying, vive la différence, right? Uh, jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do it. <laughs> okay, you did it. I made him do it. Adam, Wait, the jazz hands. Oh my God. Thank you for doing that, Nina. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the Absolutely. jazz hands, right? <laughs> All right. Ciao again, everybody. Thank you so much, Nina. That conversation was one that I'm going to be thinking about for some time now. Nina, wow, she's a dynamo and uh, clearly is a an expert when it comes to what what resilience looks like through personal and and difficult life experience. Um, today, she shared with us a lot of what was going on in her world when she was just a, a 16 year old looking to make the USA Olympic team in gymnastics. We got to talk about that, about the, the disappointment involved in not making the team and, and where she was able to pivot and move forward, bounce forward from that position to becoming a college athlete and how she had an injury that ended her ended her gymnastics career in college at LSU. We talk about that. We talk about her Emmy award-winning career as a news anchor. And again, same thing, what happened when unexpectedly she was canned from her job only only to find tragedy even just around the corner in in her next job um the really amazing story unexpected twists and turns and obviously you can see she's learned so much in all of those things and and not just in landing on her feet but in taking the lessons embedded in many of those changes those those disappointments even those disruptions and using them utilizing them as a catalyst to move forward in life and help other, help many, many people along the way. To me, that's the great alchemy that she's demonstrating. Um, and I love just how how clear she communicated uh, the stories that she told, the, the lessons she shared with us, into, including looking at, at the math, the actual math around disappointment and the math around how you, how you perceive it, how you frame it relative to the other aspects of your life. There's an actual equation, a mathematical equation that she uses and she shares with us. Um, really quite brilliant. We talk about her book, This Is Not the End. Um, and she really unpacked uh, some key principles there. We talked about the sunk cost fallacy. If you don't know what the sunk cost fallacy is, we're going to unpack that for you as well. Um, talked about how it is that Simone Biles uh, really models great leadership herself in in a particular way, and we we talk uh, in depth about the 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 gymnasts' perspective in connection with what Simone was dealing with a couple of summers ago at the Olympics when she removed herself from the meet. Um, talking about the 
the the this is in life, which is really so much of Nina's brand is is centered around looking at the this is uh, my this is the the things that that we that we deal with in our lives that that often uh, suck, <laughs> you know, in the moment. And obviously, in in the book Change Proof, we talk about the suck. Uh, as something different, the rip current, the rip tide of change. Uh, but these are other sucks that Nina brings to the table in our conversation today. I know you're going to love it. And once again, if if this is an episode that resonated with you, please share it with, with a friend, somebody that might be going through something tragic, uh, whether it's a divorce or the loss of a loved one or the loss of a child or or the loss of a livelihood or, or some other dramatic pivot uh, there are often big P pivots and little P pivots along the way. We kind of cover the gamut in, in our conversation. And if there's somebody that you think would really be inspired by what Nina shared today, feel free to share that this episode with, with those folks. Of course, we'd love to get your comments. You can always leave them at adammarkell.com forward slash comment. Um, we love the the reviews, you know, those those five star reviews on on Apple, iTunes, or wherever it is that you're consuming this podcast. Really help the algorithm to help us to help get this message out to the world. So we appreciate your helping us to do that very much. And if you've not yet determined how resilient you are in this moment, snapshot view of your own level of resilience today. Right now, all you have to do is go rankmyresilience.com to rankmyresilience.com. And in three minutes, the best part, you're going to get a snapshot view of just how resilient you are in this moment. And I will say once again, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for supporting this show. Thanks for listening. We hope you now have even more tools and greater insights to build resilience and become change proof. Remember to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and you may be featured in an upcoming episode. For more resilience tips and strategies, including support for building change-proof teams, visit adammarkell.com. To get your own free resilience assessment, go to rankmyresilience.com.